For those who say this heat is nothing new, that record stood for 80 years. We have reached or exceeded that temperature multiple times since 1990. So 1990, 2003, 2015, and then both in 2019 and in 2020. The mighty power of pop music. Was actually only told 20 minutes before we went on the stage, the event was going to be broadcast to Billie Eilish's YouTube channel, which has 45 million subscribers, which was uh, a little terrifying at first. And testing times for nature. They will unfortunately poo on themselves to try and cool themselves down as birds can't sweat. So that's like a really gross way of birds sweating, I guess. It's Friday, the 15th of July, and you're listening to Weather Snap from the Met Office. Hello, I'm Claire Nazir. Soaring temperatures continue to dominate the weather headlines, with hot conditions across many parts of the UK and eye popping temperatures over mainland Europe. Here at the Met Office, we're used to gathering and relaying warnings of extreme weather. However, the severity of the current heat wave was brought sharply into focus by this address by Met Office Chief Executive Professor Penny Endesby. The extreme heat we're forecasting right now is absolutely unprecedented. Here in the UK, we're used to treating a hot spell as a chance to go and play in the sun. This is not that sort of weather. Our lifestyles and our infrastructure are not adapted to what is coming. Please treat the warnings we are putting out as seriously as you would a red or amber warning from us for wind or snow, and follow the advice. Think about adjusting your plans for the warning period. Don't leave people or animals in hot cars, and keep a particular lookout for your family and neighbours, especially more vulnerable people. Met Office Chief Executive Penny Endersby. Regular WeatherSnap listeners will know that each week we provide the UK data records for sunshine, rainfall and temperature. This information is based on thousands of weather observations routinely taken across the country. There are, however, times when specific measurements receive extra scrutiny. At the time of this recording, models suggest an 80% chance that somewhere in the UK will see 40 degrees Celsius over the next few days. If that figure is reported, the data will need to be closely examined. To tell us more, here's Dr Mark McCarthy, Science Manager of the National Climate Information Centre. Here at the Met Office, we're receiving observations every minute of the day, continually from our network of automatic weather stations. When new records are broken, then those observations are going to receive additional scrutiny just to make sure that the measurement was taken as close to the the ideal conditions as we're able to manage. Um, So that process can involve things like comparison with the neighbouring stations, neighbouring sites in the area, Um, but also there's a team of engineers who, um, if need be, can go out to the site and actually check the equipment there. There's been a lot of indication that we are going to be seeing some incredibly hot weather through the weekend and into early next week. As somebody who analyzes data all the time and particularly looks for trends over decades, what do you say to people that say this is just typical summer weather? What we consider typical summer weather is changing because of climate change. So our climate here in the UK is warming and that is having an impact on things like summer heat, hot days and heat waves that we're experiencing. They are becoming more intense. While we can look back through our historical records and there are extreme heat waves in the past, one standout heat wave occurred, for example, over 100 years ago in 1911. And that at the time broke all known records for temperature uh, and the 9th of August that year reached 36.7 Celsius in rounds in Northamptonshire. And that record actually stood for 80 years, Um, but we have subsequently reached or exceeded that temperature multiple times since 1990. So 1990, 2003, 2015, and then both in 2019 and in 2020. And there's a possibility that we'll break it again this summer. So in terms of the heatwave impacts of 1911, what sort of thing happened? 
we saw, for example, thousands of deaths occurred in London alone, something like 4,000 deaths during the months of August and September. Um, but there were also other impacts from heat waves. So there was drought meant that water supplies had to be curtailed or switched off at times. Um, there were wildfires occurring. Agriculture was difficult. There was a lack of grass for the grazing cattle um, that had knock on impacts on things like milk prices, etc. And in terms of, say, the last four or five decades, has the average maximum temperature continued to rise? What we're seeing is the highest temperature of the year is higher than it was in the past, typically. So whereas in the past, the sort of the, the hot summer weather, we would be seeing temperatures in the high 20s uh, and sometimes in the low 30s in the UK. In our current climate, it's much more likely that we're seeing temperatures in the mid 30s and the extremes are then pushing into the high 30s, like the event in 2019 when we saw 38.7. So these extreme events while thankfully are still not commonplace, are becoming more frequent as our climate is warming. Dr Mark McCarthy, thank you very much. Well, with more details of the weather conditions we can expect over the next few days, here's Ada McGiven. The Met Office have issued amber and red warnings for extreme heat and those warnings are valid for the start of the new week. The weekend actually starts off relatively cool under an area of high pressure which is developing across the UK. Plenty of places begin Saturday with some sunshine. There will be some rain in the far north of Scotland. Otherwise that rain clears away eventually and then blue skies for many on Saturday and more manageable temperatures compared to what's to come through Sunday night and Monday and our real step up in those temperatures for Monday itself. Widely across central and southern Scotland, Northern Ireland, high 20s are expected. But across much of England and Wales, we're exceeding 30 Celsius. And in the hotter parts of central England, East Wales, eastern England, the risk of mid to high 30s of Celsius. And there's very little relief at night. So these are the minimum temperatures on Monday night into Tuesday. Widely, they're expected to be above 20 Celsius. And it looks likely that some places will see minimum temperatures of 25 Celsius. And then on Tuesday, into the 30s again across much of England and Wales. And by this stage, it looks like the most likely high temperature will be between London and Lincolnshire, and it will be 40 Celsius, the first time ever the Met Office have predicted a maximum temperature in the UK of 40 Celsius. We'll keep you updated on the forecast right here at the Met Office. There will be some relief. There is an end in sight. The middle of next week, a jet stream pushes an area of uh, perhaps showery rain or thunderstorms through, and then cooler air arrives. But for the time being, stay across all the government advice and keep yourself safe. Thanks, Aidan. While the UK braces for a potential 40 degree record, that figure was dramatically surpassed in parts of Iberia this week. Extreme heat sparked life threatening wildfires and evacuation orders across parts of Portugal and western Spain. Yesterday, temperatures in Portugal reached 47 degrees Celsius. This hot air mass has now moved northwards into France, where temperatures so far have peaked around 39 Celsius. As the effect of climate change on extreme weather events becomes more apparent, so too the need to share information and offer people positive ways to respond. A recent event, known as Overheated, aimed to do just that. Supported by the singer Billie Eilish, the event covered everything from music to sustainable fashion and carbon-friendly diets. One of those taking part was podcaster and plant-based food advocate Robbie Lockie. It was an absolutely amazing event, Claire, and it was a huge privilege to be asked. So um, I run a platform called Plant Based News, which is a vegan media and health education platform. And uh, I happen to know Billie Eilish's mum, Maggie Baird. And Maggie and I have been speaking for years. I had her on my podcast and she just reached out to me and said, Robbie, I'd love you to be involved on a panel to talk and discuss about the environmental benefits of eating a plant based diet. Of course, I actually jumped to the opportunity. Absolutely loved it. It was a yeah, really wonderful event. Now, I know Billie Eilish attracts a broad demographic from kids my daughter's age right the way through to my mum, who loves her music. Did this attract a similar sort of broad range of people? 
So at the event uh, in person, there was probably about 2000 plus people. And I would say that they were all sort of young millennial types. So possibly under 25, you know, one of my concerns that, you know, when one of my continuous concerns really is how do you communicate some of these really important issues to a much younger demographic? Are they going to be engaged? But it was absolutely fascinating to see. And I also was actually only told sort of 20 minutes before we went on the stage that the event was going to be broadcast to Billie Eilish's YouTube channel, which has 45 million subscribers, which was a little terrifying at first. But, um, you know, from people who were watching on the live stream during the event, thousands of people were watching, you know, thousands of comments were coming through from people who were engaged in the topic, really, really interested. What type of messages and comments were coming through? Just some people saying things like, you know, wow, I didn't know that, or I didn't realize my diet could have such a huge effect. Why aren't we taught this stuff at school? Um, you know, why isn't this on the media more often? Because again, you know, despite our kind of advocacy, you know, the vegan and plant-based message is still a very young idea. You know, Western civilization really has sort of lived and, and sustained itself on omnivorous diet for you know many, many generations. So there's still a lot of work to be done to try to convince people that this is a viable way of living. But it also has such a huge effect on our personal environmental footprints. And also a huge responsibility on people like Billie Eilish, because she's putting her name and her brand to this movement. It really is being pushed. Uh, I'm, I'm seeing it discussed more and more in the media, but I do think it needs to be a priority because, you know, as the Joseph Paul Oxford study suggests, you can reduce your carbon footprint by over 70 percent, um, in some cases higher, depending on what you eat as well. So, you know, Billy, she does receive criticism from people. I think people think that this is some kind of fad still, that it's uh, just a trend. Um, and they just don't believe in it. And I think one of the biggest issues, in my opinion, is misinformation and disinformation. Social media is an incredible tool, but as the study done by Twitter, false information travels six times faster than true information, often because how disinformation is packaged and how misinformation is so easy to pass on. But I think, you know, people who are out there like Billy and, and more celebrities really, really owe it to the future of our species to step up and speak out on these issues. Finally, Robbie, do you think there'll be another set of events similar to Overheated? Is Maggie talking about creating that type of event again? Because a lot of people missed out on it. Absolutely. Uh, the plan is to do it regularly and put on the event um, and bring more young people together. Because I think this is what we need to do. We need to activate more young people, more millennials who have the tools to communicate this to more people. Because as I say, the secret to changing hearts and minds is communication. These concepts and these problems and these challenges need to be communicated in a clear, concise and digestible way to help people understand the seriousness, the gravitas of this situation, because it is really, really serious. And I just don't think enough people in the public are taking it seriously enough. Now, of course, we don't want to slip into this, what some people are calling this doomism culture where we're panicking and, and terrified about everything. But we need these communicators out there. We need these young people activating their friends and their families. So I'm looking forward to more overheated events and, uh, and hopefully more people out there. Robbie Lockie, thank you very much. While the current high temperatures pose serious risks to human health and well-being, dry conditions are also proving difficult for wildlife. Limited availability of water is placing stress on many species. To hear how we can support the wildlife around us, Graham Madge spoke to Becca Smith of the RSPB. As you might expect in a heat wave like this, we've got a bit of a call out for water for animals. So, you know, you might have a water bath and we've got all sorts of creatures using that. So things like birds, amphibians, insects, butterflies and actually wildlife in general, not just water, but there will be other ways they'll be trying to cope with this heat. So um, a rather funny one that I always like to share is around birds because they will unfortunately poo on themselves to try and cool themselves down. So um, excreting that on themselves is a way of cooling down as birds can't sweat. So that's like a really gross way of um, birds sweating, I guess. And we've got um, birds and other wildlife looking for shelter as well. So dense hedges or long grass might really help um, insects and butterflies shelter out of the heat as well. There's quite a mix of things that people can do, perhaps long term measures, leaving shrubbery and longer grass. But what can people do in the meantime? 
So in the immediate sense, it's putting out water um, and fresh, clean water as well is really important. So whether that is a bird bath or even just a tray of water goes a long way. Uh, and our advice as well is to keep that clean. So refreshing it every day. And like I say, that can really help with all sorts of species, not just birds. So particularly those ground level water sources can help things like hedgehogs, amphibians as well. And making sure that when you're putting out water, if you can pop a few stones that just protrude the surface of the water, that can help things like butterflies and insects perch on them to get a little bit of water without sort of succumbing to the entire pond or likewise if any wildlife comes along it can get back out things like keeping up with feeding as well this time of year particularly in weathers like this there's less of a chance of blackbirds and other birds getting things like worms out of the soil because obviously it's so hard so if we can keep up with feeding as well just little and often that's really important What's the long term future for the everyday wildlife around us in the face of future projected hotter and drier summers? As climate change has an effect on wildlife and our landscapes, then it could possibly have effects on populations as well. So, for example, a change in food availability. So, like I was saying, if birds can't get to the food beneath the soil, or perhaps there isn't the food at the right time of year, then climate change is a real threat to our wildlife. What? other actions can gardeners do and what information can they get from the RSPB? The best place for gardeners to look is on our Nature on Your Doorstep page. So if you just type into a search engine Nature on Your Doorstep, it should hopefully come up or you can go to rspb.org.uk forward slash your doorstep. And there there's some great easy guides, even stuff you can do with a family with little ones to sort of implement little changes in your garden or bring new things in. So things like a bug hotel might provide a damp and cool shady spot for bugs. There's also sort of changes you can make in your garden too. So things like giving up peat compost. So um, peat is given out in sort of our compost bags that we uh, know and love. However, in doing so and extracting that really ancient habitat, we're actually dismantling a really important habitat, both for wildlife, but also it stores a heck of a lot of carbon. And if we can keep it in the ground, then that's the best place for it to be. So if we can pick out peat free options in your local retailer, that really helps. Becca Smith of the RSPB. Just before we go, Martin Bowles is here with last week's highs and lows. Here are the UK weather extremes for the week beginning on Monday the 4th of July and ending on Sunday the 10th of July. The highest recorded air temperature was 30.1 degrees Celsius at St James's Park in London on Sunday. The lowest temperature was 4.5 degrees, measured at Santon Downham in Suffolk early on Tuesday morning. Not everywhere had hot weather last week. Parts of Scotland had significant rainfall. The largest daily rainfall of the week was 37.6 mm at Risalak in Sutherland on Wednesday. The longest daily sunshine was 16.1 hours, recorded at RAF Leeming in North Yorkshire on Sunday. Thanks Martin. That's it for WeatherSnap. If you are in an area affected by high heat, do please stay safe. Keep a close eye on the Met Office forecast and also the website where you can find more information on health and well-being. For now, though, I'm Claire Nazir. Editor is Adrian Holloway. Thanks for listening. WeatherSnap is a podcast by the UK Met Office. For the latest weather conditions where you are, download the Met Office weather app.